Welcome back to this course on the general linear model. Today we're discussing factorial ANOVA. Factorial ANOVA is nothing new. It's just a combination of two techniques that you're already familiar with. Representing categorical predictors using dummy variables and including interactions between multiple predictors. Today we are looking at general linear models where we have two different categorical predictors and we want to include the interaction between them. So this is nothing new except for a repeat of techniques that we've already covered. So we'll just be revisiting this material and looking at it from a slightly different perspective. Let's recap the road so far. So we've looked at bivariate linear regression where the outcome variable y was a linear function with an intercept a plus a slope times a continuous predictor x. We've also looked at the special case where the predictor x was not continuous but a binary dummy variable. And we can use this to compare two groups, in other words, to perform an independent samples t-test. We've extended this basic linear model by adding blocks of predictors, where each block had the shape plus b times x, so plus a slope times the value of a predictor. And if all of the predictors are dummy variables encoding membership of different groups, then this is equivalent to an ANOVA. And we've also covered the technique of including an interaction effect which occurs when the effect of one predictor depends on the value of another predictor. We represent this by multiplying the two predictors and including the product term in our regression model. Now, in order to follow along with today's lecture, it is essential that you already master the topic of interactions. So if you still are a little shaky on this subject matter, then please revisit the lecture on interaction between binary and continuous predictors. Because today we are covering factorial ANOVA. Factorial ANOVA can be defined as regression with multiple categorical predictors and the interaction between them. This is nothing complicated. We are simply combining the following ideas dummy coding of categorical predictors and combining that with interaction effects. The reason this has a distinct name is because historically ANOVA techniques developed distinctly from regression-based techniques. When comparing multiple groups, people would calculate the group means by hand for each condition and calculate different sums of squares around these means. The ANOVA interface of SPSS still presents the output of a general linear model in line with these conventions. But nowadays we know that factorial ANOVA is just a general linear model with multiple categorical predictors. Let's consider a few use cases in which you might want to use factorial ANOVA. For neuroscience, consider an experiment where you want to compare the effect of two different drugs administered in two different ways, for example, orally or intravenously. For social science, consider that you might want to examine the effect of an empathy manipulation on prosocial behavior in young children versus teenagers. And for business and economics, consider that you might want to examine the effect of advertising type and the amount of discount offered when you offer either a 5%, 10% or 30% discount. What all of these examples have in common is that we look at two distinct categorical predictors and possibly the interaction between them. So throughout this lecture, I will use the following language. When I speak about factors, I'm talking about categorical predictors and these are usually nominal, but they could be ordinal. Each factor has multiple levels, and those are the unique categories of the categorical variable. For example, the factor dosage might have three levels, low, medium, and high. So that's an ordinal factor. And a factor drug might have two levels, drug A versus drug B, or experimental drug versus placebo control drug. If the factor A has lowercase a groups, so in this case, three groups, 
and factor B has lowercase b groups, so in this case two groups, then the total number of groups in this factorial design is six, because there are six unique combinations of the levels from the one factor with the levels of the other factor. I think it would be useful to give an example that you can follow along with. So here's some example data. Imagine a study where the dependent variable is how much you enjoyed your meal on a 0 to 5 Likert scale that we will treat as a continuous variable. We have one independent variable which is a factor, namely type of food. It has two levels. The one level is a Beyond Sausage, which is a nice vegan sausage, and the other level is Ben & Jerry's Cookies on Cookie Dough, which is my favorite vegan ice cream. And then there is another independent variable, which is the factor Topping. Topping also has two levels. The first level is Mustard and Onions, and the second level is Chocolate Sauce and Sprinkles. The design of our experiment is a 2 by 2 factorial design, where we combine both levels of type of food with both levels of type of topping. So in total there are four unique combinations. Some people get the sausage with mustard and onions, some people get Ben & Jerry's with mustard and onions, some people get the sausage with chocolate and sprinkles, and some people get Ben & Jerry's with chocolate and sprinkles. So we could represent this factorial design in a table like this, in the rows we get the different levels for food and in the columns we get the different levels for the factor topping and then there are four unique combinations. Each combination will have an observed mean level of enjoyment of the food. So for example we could say here there is a mean mu for the combination sausage with mustard and there is a mean mu for the combination sausage with chocolate and there is a mean mu for the combination ice cream with mustard and a mean mu for the combination ice cream with chocolate. When performing factorial ANOVA, historically people would calculate the sums of squares around these four group means by hand. We're not doing that, but it's useful to understand that this is how people would go about it in the past. What we are doing instead is using a regression model or the general linear model to represent factorial ANOVA using different dummy coded variables. So the first thing we do is we dummy code both factors. In this case you can just assume that the first level is the reference category. So dummy d sub a is a dummy variable for factor a equals level 2 and dummy d sub b is a dummy variable for factor b equals level 2. Then we additionally calculate an interaction term. So we take both of these dummies, dA and dB, and multiply them together to get a new variable representing the interaction between the two. Taken together, this gives us the following regression model. The predicted value of y, which is enjoyment of the food, is equal to some intercept, b sub 0, plus a slope, b sub 1, for people who are in group 2 on factor A, right, that's what dummy DA codes for, plus a slope B sub 2 for people who are in level 2 of factor B, because that's what D sub B codes for, plus a slope B sub 3 times the interaction between those two dummy variables. So how do we interpret these four parameters? Well, b sub 0 is the intercept, and that is the mean value for people who score 0 on both dummies. In other words, this is the mean level of enjoyment for people who were in the reference category for both of the factors. Then b sub 1 is the mean difference between the intercept and people who score 1 on dummy d sub a. So this is the mean difference between people who were in the reference category for both dummies and people who were in the other category for factor A. B sub 2 is the mean difference between the intercept and the mean value for people who score 1 on dummy DB, so for the people who are in the other category on factor B. And B3 is an interaction term, and that is the additional bump 
on top of the mean that people get if they score one on both dummy DA and dummy DB. So those are the people who are not in the reference category for both of the factors. If we go back to that mean table I created for the factorial design with four unique combinations of both factors, then we can simply fill in the formula for every cell of that design. And what we see is that the mean for this group, so that's the group of people who get mustard on top of their sausage, is simply equal to the intercept B sub zero because they score zero on both of the dummies. The mean for this group, that is people who get chocolate on their sausage, is the intercept plus B sub two. And the mean for this group is the intercept plus B sub one. And the mean for this group is the sum of all of the regression slopes. So what you notice here is that for a two by two factorial design, we have two dummy variables and an interaction term and an intercept, that's four parameters. These four parameters represent four means exactly. There are no two means the same. Every group can have a unique mean with just these four parameters. Now that we're talking about study designs, it is important to consider the following. Factorial ANOVA as a technique was initially designed for situations where we are conducting an experiment and because we are in control, we can determine how many participants there are in each cell of the factorial design. So we can make sure that there are an equal number of participants assigned to each of those cells. Whenever that happens, the design is called balanced. A factorial design is balanced when there is an equal number of participants in every unique combination of factors but it's also fine to have an unbalanced design, except perhaps for the assumption of normality and homoscedasticity of residuals. But if you compare this to any other regression model, we never assumed that we would have an equal number of participants for every unique combination of predictor values. So this is not a hard assumption of factorial ANOVA either. The downside of having an unbalanced design, however, is that we will have less power to detect a true effect. So let's talk about effects in a factorial design. In factorial designs, it is common to discuss the following effects. Main effects of factor A and factor B. And if we translate this term main effect to our familiar language of the general linear model, that corresponds to the partial effect of the factor controlling for the other factor and optionally the interaction. This is different from the direct effect of factor A on the outcome Y, which does not control for factor B or the interaction. And then we also talk about interaction effects between factors A and B. And the interaction effect tells us whether the effect of factor A depends on the value of factor B or not. If we have a theory that implies an interaction effect, for example, we expect that the effectiveness of heart medication versus placebo control will differ between men and women. Then we must include an interaction effect in our model and first test whether that is significant or not. And the reason we first test the interaction effect is because it doesn't really make sense to interpret main effects if they are contingent on an interaction. If your theory does not include an interaction effect, you don't have to model it either. But even if your theory does not include an interaction effect, you could still consider testing for one just as an assumption check of the assumption that your model is correctly specified. If you're just doing this as an assumption check and the interaction effect is not significant, then it's better to omit it because the main effects can be straightforwardly interpreted if there is no interaction in the model. When we are interpreting interactions, remember that interactions are symmetrical. The interaction between A and B is the same as the interaction between B and A. But for theoretical reasons, you may want to interpret one of them as the main predictor and the other as an effect modifier. For example, your theory might imply that the effect of the type of drug is moderated by the method of administration. 
So here the effect of the drug is the main effect of interest and the mode of administration is an effect modifier. It makes much less sense to say that the effect of a mode of administration of a drug is moderated by what type of drug it is. From a theoretical perspective, that just sounds less sensible. But note that the distinction between how you interpret your results is a theoretical decision. It's not a statistical choice. So it can be instructive to represent our theoretical model using box diagrams. Technically speaking, a model with an interaction effect looks like the figure on the right. And there we see that we have a predictor X and a moderator M, which both have causal effects on the outcome Y. And then we have a product term of X multiplied by M, which also has a causal effect on the outcome Y. But for theoretical reasons, we may prefer to call one of them the effect modifier and represent it with a diagram like this. Here we see that we are primarily interested in the effect of X on Y, but that effect is modified by the moderator M. So M points at the arrow between X and Y. Again, mathematically, these two diagrams are equivalent, but the one on the left indicates that we have theoretical reasons to call one of the predictors the moderator of the effect of the other one. Now you can just go back and rewatch the lecture on interaction effects, but then there are a few things that you want to pay special attention to when calculating interaction terms between two categorical variables. The first thing is that each factor with k levels, so for example, if you have a factor major, which has three levels, cognitive neuroscience, social science, and business and economics, you can represent that with k minus one dummy variables. So a three level factor can be represented by two dummy variables. If you then want to include an interaction between factor A and factor B, then you must multiply all of the dummies of factor A with all of the dummies of factor B. So if factor A has three groups, you create two dummies, D sub A1 and D sub A2. And if factor B has two groups, then you create one dummy, D sub B1. And then to create the interaction terms, you multiply all of these dummies. So your first interaction term will be D sub A1, times d sub b1, and the second interaction term will be d sub a2 times d sub b1. Repeat the mantra, dummies always stick together. So always include all dummies that code for the same factor, or that code for interactions between the factors in your models together in a single analysis step. Always include dummies that code for the same factor, in the model together. And the same goes for interaction effects. Always include all of the interaction variables and all of the dummy variables for the two interacting variables together in the model in the same step. Now let's go back to our empirical example. Remember that we were giving people sausages or ice cream with mustard or chocolate topping. Now we might expect to see a means plot that looks somewhat like this. On the x-axis we see the two types of food, on the left ice cream and on the right sausage. And on the y-axis we see the observed value of liking. We see the observed mean value of liking. And then we see that the blue line represents mustard and the red line represents chocolate. People really don't like ice cream with mustard but people really like ice cream with chocolate. And people don't really like sausage with chocolate. And people do quite like sausage with mustard. Remember that I told you about the two types of effects of interest, main effects and interaction effects. The main effect is the effect of one factor controlling for the effect of the other factor and optionally the interaction. So if we look at the main effect of food on liking, we don't see a preference. We just see a flat line from ice cream to sausage. And we get there 
by taking the middle point between these two means for ice cream and a middle point between these two means for sausage. And we see that the mean here is in the middle and the mean here is in the middle. So we just end up with a flat line. Now we can only take such unweighted means if it's a balanced factorial design with equal number of participants in all groups. But assuming that this is a balanced design, the mean of the two levels of topping for ice cream is just in between those two points. And the mean for sausage is just exactly in between those two points. We can also look at the main effect for topping and conclude that there is a slight preference for chocolate topping. How do we get that? Well, again, assuming a balanced design, the red line represents chocolate and we just intersect the red line exactly in the middle and the blue line represents mustard. We intersect the blue line exactly in the middle and we see that the red line's middle is slightly higher than the blue line's middle. So there's a slight preference for chocolate topping. And again, we can only do this if the design is balanced. If we have hypotheses about the interaction effect or the main effects, we can write them as follows. For the interaction, we might say that we expect the difference between these two means to be exactly the same as the difference between these two means. In other words, mu sub 1 1 minus mu sub 1 2 is the same as mu sub 2 1 minus mu sub 2 2. Or we could say that we expect the difference between this mean and this mean to be the same as the difference between this mean and this mean. And we could also say that those mean differences are all equal to zero. A null hypothesis for a main effect of factor A would look as follows. H null is that the marginal mean of factor A equals one is equal to the marginal mean of factor A equals two. So the difference between these two marginal means is equal to zero. And for the main effect of factor B, we would hypothesize that the mean difference between the marginal mean of B equals one and the marginal mean of B equals two is zero. Let's look at a few stylized examples of factorial designs. So in the top left picture, we see that there are no effects of either factor A or B, right? So both factor A and B score on average the same on the dependent variable Y. So for factor A, we see a horizontal line and for factor B, we see no difference between these two lines. In this figure, we see a main effect of factor B because even though for factor A, both lines are horizontal, the line for factor B equals one is a bit higher than for B equals two. Here, on the other hand, we see a main effect of factor A. The lines are both exactly parallel, but we see that when we go from factor A equals one to factor A equals two, the lines both go up. Here we see an interaction effect and we see what's called a perfect crossover interaction. We see that if we go from factor A equals one to factor A equals two, and we are in the group with factor B equals one, we go up. But if we are in the factor B equals two group, we go down. In the middle figure here, we see a combination of an interaction and the main effect of factor B. So it must be an interaction because the two lines are not parallel, they are distinct. And we also see a main effect of factor B because the intersection of the red line, which represents factor B equals one, is higher than the intersection of the blue line, which represents factor B equals two. So there's a difference here. And the direction of the slope is also different. Here we see a main effect of factor A and an interaction. We know there must be an interaction because the lines are not parallel. And we know that there is a main effect of factor A because the middle point between these two points, the red and the blue, is higher for factor A equals one than for factor A equals two. Here we see no interaction because the lines are parallel, but we do see a main effect of factor A because both of the lines go diagonally upwards and the main effect of factor B because the intersection of the red line is higher than the intersection of the blue line.
In the middle finger on the bottom row, we see a main effect of factor A and a main effect of factor B and an interaction. So we know there must be an interaction because the lines are not parallel. We know there is a main effect of factor A because if we go from A equals 1 to A equals 2, we end up somewhere here in the middle between the red and the blue point, and that is a positive effect. And there must also be a main effect of factor B because if we go from the intersection of the blue line to the intersection of the red line, there is also a mean difference. And finally, here is another example where there is a main effect of factor A and of factor B and an interaction. There must be an interaction because the lines are not parallel. There must be a main effect of factor A because the middle point between the red and the blue dot on the left is higher than the middle point between the red and the blue dot on the right. And there must be a main effect of factor B because the intersection of the blue line here is lower than the intersection of the blue line here. So that's how you can interpret such stylized examples. To boil it down to a few rules, if the lines in a means plot are parallel, then there is no interaction. If the lines cross, even if they only cross when you extrapolate them beyond the figure, then there must be a non-zero interaction effect. There is a main effect of factor A when the middle of the points on the left is not the same as the middle of the points on the right. And there's a main effect of factor B when the middle point of one of the lines is above or below the middle point of the other line. So if people were to like ice cream more than sausage, regardless of topping, we would expect a pattern of means like this, where the means for both toppings for ice cream are higher than the means of both toppings for sausage. If people like chocolate sauce more than mustard, regardless of the type of food, then we would expect a pattern of means like this, where the line for mustard is lower than the line for chocolate. And if there's an interaction, that means that the preference for food depends on the topping and vice versa. So we see a crossover interaction occurring here where people like mustard more on sausage and chocolate more on ice cream. And that is indeed what we see in the real data of this example. In this figure, I also visualize the observed data points in a slightly faded out color. And you can see that these points only represent the mean of those groups. And in reality, there's quite a bit of variability around those group means as well. So let's look at these results in numbers. First of all, we look at the coefficients table of a regression model. And then we see the four coefficients that we discussed previously. We see an intercept. We see a dummy for food equals ice cream. So the reference category must be sausage. We see a dummy for topping equals chocolate. So the reference category must be mustard. And we see an interaction term for food is ice cream times topping chocolate. Each of these coefficients has a standard error and a corresponding t-test statistic and a p-value, and they are all significant. But when we're testing for effects in factorial ANOVA, things get a little bit more complicated because we often represent the values of one categorical variable with multiple dummy variables. So the problem is that if we have more than two categories in one variable, those coefficients and their tests do not give us an overall significance test for the main effect of that predictor or for the interaction term. So we have previously solved this problem, if you think back, and we used hierarchical f-tests for models that included or excluded all of the dummies for that predictor to see if the overall effect of the predictor was significant or not. So what we did is we used an f-test for nested models we performed hierarchical R-square tests for categorical variables with more than two categories. For example, if we have factor A with three categories, there must be two dummies to represent membership of those categories. And if we have factor B with two categories, there will be one dummy to represent the difference between those two categories. And their interaction will consist of two product terms. So let's say we want to know what's the unique effect of the interaction term. 
The way to go about this is to first estimate a model that includes all of the dummies of factor A and factor B, then in a second step add both of the product terms and perform an f-test for the delta r square, so for the difference in explained variance. In ANOVA, we essentially perform the same nested model test for each individual variable and for the interaction term. And that's going to give us a test for the unique variance explained by factor A and by factor B and by the interaction between factors A and B. So you have prior experience looking at the unique explained variance, for example, for interaction terms, using a hierarchical f-test for the delta r square. Now we can apply the same logic to look at the unique effect of factor A, or the unique effect of factor B, or, as in the previous slide, the unique effect of the interaction between the two of them. In the ANOVA literature, it is customary to report the explained variance in terms of partial sums of squares explained by each variable, along with an f-test for those partial sums of squares. So here are the same results that we just looked at in terms of the coefficients table from a regression analysis, but this time we look at those results in terms of partial explained sums of squares. So what we see is that the factor food, with its two levels, explains two sums of squares on one degree of freedom, so the mean square is 2 divided by 1 is 2, and that corresponds to an f value of 3.45, which is not going to be significant, with a p-value of 0.07. So the main effect of food is not significant. If we look at the effect of topping, we see that there are 6.27 explained sums of squares due to this factor on one degree of freedom, so 6.27 divided by 1 is 6.27, that's the mean square, and that corresponds to an f value of 10.8, which does result in a significant p-value, so there is a significant main effect of topping. People prefer one of the toppings more than the other. And if we look at the interaction between food and topping, we see a very large sum of squares, 120.02, that corresponds to an f value of 206.6 with a significant p value. So the preference for type of food depends on the type of topping and vice versa. And of course, to get the f value, we divide these mean squares by the residual mean square, right? So you can see that 206 is 120 divided by 0.58. In previous lectures, I've explained this concept of R-square to you in terms of these bubble plots, so I thought we would revisit those and look at how we can interpret the main effect and the interaction effects in these bubble plots. So imagine that the red bubble represents all of the variance in our outcome variable Y. In this case, that's the variable enjoyment of the food. And then we have two factors, factor A and factor B and both of them explain part of the variance in the dependent variable y. But there's also an interaction between a and b that explains a lot of the variance in y. So you see that I've labeled several parts of this plot. The part labeled a is the sum of squares explained by factor a only. So that's the unique sum of squares explained by factor a. Now remember that factor A is food, and the effect of food was not significant. So in this figure, we indeed see no unique effect of factor A. And factor B is the unique effect of the sums of squares explained by factor B. And that is the section labeled B here. That is the unique explained variance due to factor B that does not overlap with any of the other predictors in the model. And then C is the sum of squares explained by the interaction between factor A and factor B. And that is this section labeled C here. And we see that the interaction also explains any variance that would have otherwise been explained by factor A, which is why factor A doesn't have a unique effect. Any effect that it would have had is subsumed by the interaction. To calculate 
the F ratios, we compared this unique explained variance to the unexplained variance. And the unexplained variance is now represented by the label A. So the unexplained variance is this section in red here. And that section represents the sum of squared errors, which is also known as the SSE. Or in ANOVA context, it's also sometimes known as the within groups sum of squares, the SSW. Out of the total variance of the dependent variable Y, part of it is unexplained, that part is labeled A, and other parts are explained by different combinations of the predictors and their interaction. We see the parts B, C, D, E, F, and G. Those sections are all explained by the predictors, and if we add them together, we get the corrected model sum of squares, which corresponds to the sum of squares for the regression, which is also called the sum of squares between groups in ANOVA context. So that's called the SSR or SSB. The total sum of squares in the outcome Y is equal to the sum of squares for the regression plus the sum of squares for the error. And that is sometimes called the corrected total sum of squares or SST. And to get the SSR back, we can take the SST, subtract the error sum of squares, the SSE, and then we get the SSR. In other words, the total sum of squares minus the error sum of squares is the explained portion of the sum of squares or the SSR. When we are testing the significance of the effects of each factor and their interaction, we need to use a certain degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom for each factor are equal to the number of categories minus one, so k minus one. And that corresponds to the number of dummies that we use to represent it in the model. The same applies for a test of the explained variance by the interaction. Its degrees of freedom are also equal to the number of dummies that we use to represent that interaction. So in the food choices example, we need one dummy to represent the interaction effect, so there will be one degree of freedom. But as we've encountered previously, the problem with representing effects in terms of sums of squares is that sums of squares are not on any meaningfully interpretable scale. So if we want to know how big is this effect, we need to convert the sums of squares to a standardized effect size measure. And we called that effect size R square or explained variance. We've also previously covered that in ANOVA contexts, R square is often called eta squared. They are exactly the same, so their interpretation is also identical. How large is the variance in the outcome that is explained by each factor relative to the total variance? It's easy to calculate the eta squared for each of the factors from the sums of squares that we find in this ANOVA table. To get the explained variance eta squared for factor A, we take the sum of squares for factor A and divide it by the total sum of squares. And to get the eta squared for factor B, we take the sum of squares explained by factor B and divide that by the total sum of squares. And to get the eta squared for the interaction effect, we take the sum of squares explained by the interaction effect and divide that by the total sum of squares. But aside from eta squared, there is another effect size that's commonly reported in ANOVA, and that is the partial eta squared. And instead of looking at the size of the explained sum of squares for a factor relative to the total sum of squares, the partial eta squared looks at the size of the explained sum of squares relative to that same sum of squares plus the unexplained portion of the sum of squares, so the sum of squared errors. To calculate the partial eta squared for factor A, for example, we would start by taking the sum of squares explained by factor A and divide that by the sum of squares explained by factor A plus the error sum of squares. And in a similar vein, to get the partial eta squared for the interaction term, we would take the sum of squares explained by the interaction term and divide that by that same value plus the error sum of squares. 
So to compare the interpretation of eta squared and partial eta squared, it's useful to go back to this bubble plot. So the eta squared for factor b would be the sum of squares explained by factor b, and that is the portion labeled b in this plot, and divide that by the total sum of squares. So the total sum of squares is the, all of the variance in variable a, so that's section a plus section b plus section c plus section d, e, f, and g, the total pi of variable a. That is the eta squared. And then to get the partial eta squared, we just look at how large is the variance explained by factor B relative to the variance explained by factor B plus the error variance. So that will be answering the question, how big is the slice labeled B relative to the slice labeled B plus the slice labeled A? That's all you need to know to do a successful factorial ANOVA. Make sure that you go and refresh previous lectures on ANOVA and on interactions, because that will really help what you learned this week to make more sense. Good luck in the tutorials and see you soon.